Oh man, we have a sliver of daylight left and we are checking out a, a hidden gem at Shiloh and one that the American Battlefield Trust members and supporters should be proud of. We're at a place called Fallen Timbers and just to set it up and bring Parker Hills back here, this is after the Battle of Shiloh. That was April 6th and 7th, 1862. By the 8th, the Union Army is starting to move in this direction, move on toward their what will become their next objective, Corinth, Mississippi. There's some Confederate field hospitals in the area and there's still some lurking cavalry, so let's get into this a little bit. Parker Hills Battle Focus Tours. This is uh, Fallen Timbers and there are different hypotheses on why all of the trees were down. Some say the area had recently been logged. I subscribe to the theory that a tornado had recently come through here. Up here they call them cyclones, uh, but they come fr quite frequently and when they do they leave devastating swaths of trees like jack, like just jack straws all over. And I can just see uh, a tornado coming through this area and leveling this field. In any case, it is a field full of fallen timber, very accurate description. Now, Grant on the 8th of April, he's in, not in any real mood to pursue. Uh, he's pretty beat up, uh, even though he should be pursuing. He, he's now, remember Henry Halleck's gonna show up on the 11th and take command of all, of all three armies here because John Pope's army is going to arrive. Uh, and uh, it will take, Halleck will then take 30 days to march to Corinth. But here on the 8th, Grant will tell Sherman to give him two brigades and tell him to move out of down both roads, the Bark Road and the Owl Creek Road, and find out what's out there. Well, uh, the old Owl Creek Road is just off to our right. We're here on the Bark Road here, and uh, one of the brigades will come up. Woods Brigade will come up this road. Now there's a Confederate hospital about uh, 250 yards that away on the other side of a very small creek. They're there to take advantage of the waters of that creek. And Forrest is here with 350 uh, soldiers. Their mission is to guard this hospital and be a rear guard for the Army. They basically have shotguns. They, these, his cavalry is not very well armed. Uh, he has a pistol uh, and as, as, as the Federal skirmishers begin to come this away, towards us from the distance. Forrest will see them out there and he will charge. He always, it's always offensive in nature, always makes a charge with 350 men. Remember, a brigade is 1,500 and he's got 350 men. And he, he, but he's got a cavalry charge, he's got the element of surprise. He comes charging across these, these fallen timber, which must have been very difficult on horseback. And as he's doing so, he's blasting away. And when his men see how many Federals they are, initially they see just a skirmish line. And suddenly as they run the skirmish line back, they see a brigade out there, roughly 1,500 soldiers out there. And they pull back on their reins. Now Forrest has got his blood up. Uh, and his face were turned incredibly red. His eyes were bulged he, when he would get, get in the heat of combat. And he doesn't realize his men have stopped. And he keeps charging. And he's firing into the Federals and suddenly he's surrounded by them. They, they're firing and saying, shoot the, shoot the rib, kill him, knock him off his horse. And somebody will stick a musket right up towards his spine and fire a mini ball that will lodge in his, go through his hip and lodge against his spine. Very, very painful wound. Uh, Forrest will manage to escape this. He will, he, as a matter of fact, Sherman will later write. He said, me and my staff and I, uh, our horses slid in the mud and he said, I'm convinced that if Forrest hadn't emptied his pistols, I wouldn't be writing this. Uh, he put the skier on him, is what he called it, putting the skier on him. Well, Forrest will then uh, escape, come back to his men. He's in great pain. He will try riding a buggy back to Corinth. He can't do it, and he'll finally just mount a horseback, but the buggy is too, uh, on these rough roads, just too rough, he'll ride back. He will keep that bullet in him for uh, another couple of years. They don't want to remove it. They're afraid it'll paralyze him, but he will recover that. And two months later, you know, he's back in, he's back in combat. Uh, so this will be one of his more severe wounds right here at Fallen Timbers. It will end any chance of a federal pursuit. Oh, they'll capture the hospital, but that's pretty much it. Uh, and the, the Confederate Army is allowed to go unmolested into Corinth after this. So uh, a little, little brutality goes a long way and it worked real well right here for Bedford Forest. Chris? One of the things that I think is really kind of cool about this landscape too in this, in this particular incident is it's, you know, central to the, the forest myth um, where if you remember Shelby Foote telling the story about 
Forrest being on his horse and reaching down and picking someone up and putting them behind him as he rides off and using that federal soldier as a human shield. Now, it sounds great. Shelby Foote tells it in wonderful style. And it's one of those things you want to believe if you're a big forest advocate. But for any of you who've ever ridden a horse before, you know that the physics of that are impossible. To reach down and hoist with one hand a person who's even a thin 100 pounds and throw them up on the saddle behind you, logistically, it's just not possible. Um, but it's a great story. Um, the other thing that I think is really kind of interesting and, and sort of poetic justice about this story, um, as we were leaving the park this evening, and the park looked absolutely beautiful, by the way. We had uh, just, uh, we're, we're in awe at how beautiful Shiloh National Battlefield was for us today. As we were leaving and we're passing through the crossroads on our way out of town, uh, Parker said, they really need to have a 20 pound howitzer here. Is that 24 pounds. 24 pounder howitzer here. And that's allegedly the, the, the cannon that Sherman fired as the last shot of the battle. Again, an, another little piece of Shiloh mythology. Okay, so, you know, Sherman wanted to claim having the last shot, but let's finish the story and come here to Falling Timbers where um, Sherman gets skeered off the field um, because of this aggressive action by Forrest. So if we're really talking about how to wrap things up, it's not that fine, noble last shot of Sherman's. It's kind of being driven from this battlefield right here. But as we've talked about it many times today, the mythology of the stories that we know from these battlefields is sometimes very different than the actual history of what happens here. And that's why it's important to come out here, walk the ground, learn the history, and put all those pieces together. Gary? I think so did somebody call for a thin hundred pounder. <laughs> um, so I, I want to click out something that you just talked about, Chris, too, because it is important to preserve this land to be able to come out. Uh, of course, the members of the trust preserve more than 250 acres, got the core, the main parts of this whole battlefield at Fallen Timbers in 2012. So thanks to everybody who was involved. Um, you know, but you were talking about how the park is really integral in, in keeping the park looking the way that it is, keeping the woodlots where they were at the time and maintaining it in a beautiful way so that visitors can have a good experience. I would say that's another pillar of it. You need to save the land, you need to maintain and steward that land properly. You also need to be able to catalog all the stories that are going on. You need battlefield guides and rangers and, and, and things like that to take you around these places. You need the museums to bring together all of the uh, objects, you know, the stuff of history as well. And you need one more thing I would suggest, and that is to put things into context with road signage. And this is where our friends at Civil War Trails come in handy because they claim, and I tend to buy it, that they have the world's largest plain air museum with thousands of signs around uh, Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and here at Tennessee where they've done so much work and you're seeing one of their newer signs out here and they just do a great job. They're a great partner of ours. Uh, they're great for tourism. People like having these signs in their communities uh, so that people are going to stay a little longer. You stop at 10 signs, suddenly you might need to eat another meal or stay a little longer. So we're a big fan of Civil War Trails. Civil War Trails, there's always something cool to see and do along the trail. Um, this has been a packed day. So uh, to Chris White, Tim Smith, Chris Mikowski, Andy Poulton, uh, and Parker Hills, uh, thank you so much for all that we were able to do. And thank you all for sending us out here in the first place. And of course, for supporting battlefield preservation and education.